Hey, it's Alan, and I just wanted to let you know that you can now listen to the ongoing history of new music early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Here's a question. What is a guitar hero? Yes, yes, it's a video game that vaguely simulates playing a real guitar. What else? Okay, it does mean someone who can rock the expert level at Guitar Hero, the video game. But before that came along, it meant something totally different. A Guitar Hero was a guy, and it was almost always a guy, who achieved a seemingly supernatural mastery of the electric guitar. They were so good that other experts looked to them to learn and for inspiration. We had Chuck Berry, Jimi Hendrix, Eric Clapton, Jimmy Page, Pete Townsend, Jeff Beck. They were among the first to be declared guitar heroes. They pushed the limits of what could be done with that instrument and amplifiers and effects pedals. More followed. There was uh, Eddie Van Halen, Angus Young of ACDC, The Edge from U2, Slash, Stevie Ray Vaughan, Randy Rhodes, all excellent players. This got me thinking about guitar heroes from the world of alt-rock, specifically from the period forward from when things exploded in the early 1990s. They aren't necessarily better than the first generation of guitar heroes. They're just different, you know? Let's make a list, shall we? This is the Ongoing History of New Music Podcast with Alan Cross. Welcome again, I'm Alan Cross, and this is the first of a two-parter on modern-day alt-rock guitar heroes. And before anybody gets all bent out of shape that there aren't any women on this list, hang tight. Women will get their own show. That'll be part two. Let's begin by defining what it means to be an alt-rock guitar hero. First of all, you have to have great technique. You might show off that technique by shredding through solos, but not necessarily. That's an old metric. Still valid in some circles, but isn't necessarily a requirement anymore. For years, alt-rock guitarists eschewed classic rock-style guitar solos that featured 100 notes a second. That sort of playing was not part of alt-rock culture. Technique was expressed in other ways other than solos that were measured by speed, you know, number of notes per second. This leads to a discussion of creativity, you know, new sounds, unusual tunings, different outboard technologies like pedals and processors, new ways of playing rhythm and construction of melodies. Then there's the matter of presentation. Now, guitar heroes have to have a certain sense of style and performance that, that's really hard to quantify. How they play is just as important as what they play. It's one of those, you know, when you hear it sort of things. And we're going to do a lot of listening on these episodes, so you'll see what I mean. And finally, guitar heroes need to have a certain mystique about them. How do they do what they do? Where do they get their ideas? What sorts of mysterious equipment and electronics do they use? And what are they really like as people? So while being able to come up with killer riffs is still key, it's not going to be enough to make this particular list. For example, we all love Dave Grohl, and the Foo Fighters have been mega successful, and he's probably inspired millions of kids to take up playing the guitar. He's a very good player, but is his technique up there with the best? Is he as creative a player, as groundbreaking as some people that we're going to talk about? You might want to fight me on this, but I don't think so. In fact, you may disagree with some of my picks, but that's the fun of making a list like this, right? Maybe the best way to explore this topic is to just dive right in and start deconstructing things. Now, I'm not going to rank anyone in any particular order. This is just my opinion of the greatest guitar heroes of the alt-rock era, which is about 1994. We're going to start with Johnny Greenwood of Radiohead. He's the youngest member of the band and the last to join. And frankly, he only made it into the band because he kept hanging around with his older brother Colin so much that he just was sort of folded into the group. Guitar is his first instrument, but he can also play piano, any number of electronic instruments, viola, harmonica, banjo, and peculiar instruments like the ancient Ons Marino and the Indian Tanpura. One of his favorite things is to experiment with new and unusual instruments from all over the world. The only thing he can't do is sing, and, and that's by his own admission. Not only has Johnny been a key element to the Radiohead sound, but he's also become quite the composer on his own, especially when it comes to soundtracks for movies, TV shows, and documentaries. This guy can work in a variety of styles, rock, indie, jazz, chamber orchestras, and full-on classical music. He's also something of an expert in the history of reggae music, if you can believe it. 
Johnny is also very much into things like kraut rock, that very German sort of rock that came about in the 1970s, and the noise we get from bands like Sonic Youth. But back to the guitar. His favorites are a specially wired Fender Telecaster and a Fender Starcaster built in the mid-1970s. But this is really important. He also refuses to buy into this whole idea of the guitar hero. To him, guitars are just for making music, like, I don't know, a typewriter was used to write novels or a vacuum cleaner is used for housework. With all that being said, let's sample some of Johnny's work. There's plenty of guitar-based Radiohead material to choose from, but here's one of my favorites. This is from the In Rainbows album, and it's called House of Cards. Radiohead featuring reluctant guitar hero Johnny Greenwood. You might find my next choice a little strange, but I have a lot of admiration for Adam Slack of the Struts. He grew up listening to the Rolling Stones, he loves Keith Richards, 70s glam rock from Bowie and T-Rex, and Queen. Now keep that in mind for just a second. And it was listening to Green Day that got him interested in the guitar in the first place, specifically the video for the song Minority from the 2000 album Warning. As for guitars, he's mainly a Gibson guy, specifically a Les Paul Jr. from 1968. But since the struts have started getting more attention, he's commissioned a couple of custom instruments. He has one from a company called Fletcher, and KZ Guitar Works out of Japan worked with him to design a semi-hollow body with a fatter neck. He also has a full-size Les Paul that he bought from Mike McCready of Pearl Jam. He actually calls this the best instrument he's ever owned because it never seems to go out of tune. Now, back to Queen. If you had to ask Adam about his greatest influence, he would probably tell you it was Brian May of Queen. That KZ guitar that we talked about was inspired by something Brian used to play. As for amps, he's got tons of them. Marshall, Vox, Three Monkeys among them. And again, we go back to Queen. Now I want you to listen to this. Listen to the solo Adam does on this song. He says it was totally inspired by Queen and specifically Brian May. It's called One Night Only. The Struts featuring Adam Slack on guitar. We need to get Josh Homme of Queens of the Stone Age in here, and he will be the first to admit that he's not the flashiest of players. He even says that he often plays guitar solos to make fun of guitar solos. But he plays in a style that is instantly recognizable, and this goes back to this definition that we tried to create for the alt-rock guitar hero. His signature chunky riffy sound is a big part of the foundations of what we now call stoner rock. He started out in a band called Caius, which evolved into Queens. His first music lessons were on guitar, but his Polish teacher insisted on having him learn polkas. Now, I want you to remember that because we're actually going to return to this fact in just a bit, polkas. He got into Jimi Hendrix and then Jimmy Page, and then he discovered ZZ Top. Billy Gibbons' sound made a huge impact on Josh, not just with his riffage, but how he had a way of tapping out individual notes in the middle of everything. So, yeah, there is a lot of ZZ Top and Queens of the Stone Age. Now, back to this idea of polkas. Many of them are written in 2-4 time, so they have a particular sort of bounce to them. And when Josh was learning to play these polkas, he was 9, 10, 11 years old. He didn't use a pick. Instead, he developed a technique of plucking the strings with his thumb and fingers. And because he learned how to play full chords from the beginning... He later discovered at age 13 that if he took a note out of a proper chord, he ended up with a cooler sound, a darker sort of tone. And that, along with the finger picking, became part of his signature sound. So let's add all this up. The bounce of the polka, the finger picking, the subtractive way he plays chords, and the ZZ Top type riffage. This is how we ended up with something like this. Josh Homme in Queens of the Stone Age. And now that we've deconstructed his playing style and his influences, Queen songs may never sound the same way to you ever again. When we come back, two more guitar heroes from the alt-rock era, Adam Jones of Tool and the Chili Peppers' John Frusciante.
Welcome back. I'm Alan Cross, and we're looking at some of the big guitar heroes of the alt-rock era, which is to say players from the 1990s onward. I've always been really impressed by John Frusciante, especially when he was with the Red Hot Chili Peppers. His thing, especially in his first go-round with the band, involved playing with tone, melody, rhythm, and structure instead of being you know, really flashy with his playing. He's definitely capable of that, but he almost always kept that in check. He seems to believe that his playing must serve the song and not in any way draw attention to what he's doing. He thinks that the best guitar playing was done in the 1960s, so the best he can do is listen and learn and maybe help things evolve. Here's a quote from an interview in Kerrang! magazine. People believe that by playing faster and creating new playing techniques, you can progress forward, but then they realize that emotionally, they don't progress at all. They transmit nothing to the people listening, and they stay at where Hendrix was three decades ago. Here are some things that you should know about John. First of all, much of his sound is derived from the fact that he plays almost exclusively vintage guitars. If it was made after 1970, he wants nothing to do with it. His favorites include a 1962 Red Fender Jaguar, a 1962 Sunburst Fender Stratocaster, and two guitars from 1955, a Strat and a Gretsch White Falcon. Oh, and then there's also a Yamaha SG. When it comes to acoustic work, it's almost always his Martin 010, which was built sometime in the 1950s. John had a lot more guitars, but he lost all of them when his house burned down in 1996. John believes that imperfections and mistakes can actually make a musical work better. Trying to get clean tones from a guitar is a bad idea. He wants to get things wonky and distorted and weird. The other thing he often does is mistreat his guitar, and that's his word, mistreat, because that can sometimes result in cool new sounds. And who does he look for for inspiration? Well, we talked about Hendrix, but also Joe Strummer, Captain Beefheart, Frank Zappa, blues legend Robert Johnson, Bernard Sumner of New Order. And this is interesting. He is a real thing for John McGock of Susie and the Banshees because his sound can be so different from song to song. This song, I think, represents one of the greatest showcases of John's talent. It came out of a jam session with Flea sometime in early 1990. And the album on which it appears was recorded at a place called The Mansion that is said to be haunted. It is said that in 1918, the owner of the house pushed his girlfriend to her death off the balcony. And then that original house burned down and then had to be rebuilt. There are also stories that ghosts touch people, forces that change the temperature of a room, and weird gremlins that turn up in the electronics. In fact, if you look carefully at the artwork for the Chili Peppers album Blood Sugar Sex Magic, you'll see what looks like a weird glowing orb that's part of a group photo. It was poltergeisty things like this that inspired John to create the otherworldly guitars in songs like this. Chili Peppers featuring guitarist John Frusciante, at the time doing his best to conjure up the sounds of ghosts with his guitar. Let's move on to Adam Jones of Tool. And to be clear, Tool is Adam's band. He formed it, he runs it. And if you're a Tool fan and you've deconstructed all the records, it'll come as no surprise that Adam has plenty of formal training. He learned all about music through something known as the Suzuki Method, which has been around for decades. It involves learning to play by ear rather than from sheet music. It encourages public performances from a very young age, and it emphasizes something called tonalization. That isn't so much about playing notes, which of course you have to do in playing music, but it's also about finding and recognizing beautiful and interesting tones from an instrument. And that concept has been very, very important to Adam and the music he's helped create with Tool. Again, it's not just the notes, it's the sounds. Very Suzuki method. Adam's first instrument was the violin, which is a Suzuki method staple, and he learned to play classical music, which of course makes sense if you're at all familiar with Tool's music, right? He then moved to bass before picking up a six-string guitar. And as for his style, he, uh, he, he really doesn't have one. It's, it's back to that sounds over notes thing. Power chords when needed, polyrhythmic riffs when required, uh, triplets, arpeggios, whatever that particular song requires. And he's not shy about using all manner of outboard gear to get those sounds. 
His favorite guitar is a Gibson Les Paul. He has lots of them, but his favorite might be a special Silverburst edition. And there's some mythology here. It is said that the weight of the paint used for the 1979 model, which is what Adam has, imbues a special sort of tone to the guitar. Another legend says that Adam has a stray screw or nail somewhere in his guitar, which gives it that little extra something special. As for amps, he loves old school Marshalls, the kind with the tubes. He says that no two Marshall tube amps sound the same, so when you find one that sounds good, you keep it. Almost every song Tool does seems to be in drop D tuning. And this is something else to listen for. Adam likes to do exactly the opposite of what Josh Homme does. Josh, you remember, removes some notes from chords. Adam adds additional notes to a lot of the chords he plays. And this explains some of the thickness that we hear in Tool guitar parts. Let's listen to some Tool, taking note of how Adam uses all kinds of different techniques and is always looking for those interesting sounds. Here's Think This. Tool and Stink Fist from the Enema album. Some great work by guitarist Adam Jones. Next up on our list is Jack White. Now, Jack has often said that he was born in the wrong generation. He feels that as a musician, he has an old soul. And this soul would have been much happier in the 1930s or, or maybe even the late 1800s. He's part of the digital age, but he really prefers when things were exclusively analog. He believes in analog recordings, even old scratchy 78s made in the late 1920s. He says that they have a warmth and authenticity that you just can't get with digital technology. For example, while he may edit his music in a digital program like Pro Tools, he always records the music onto old school magnetic tape. He has two ancient Studer tape machines that record eight tracks each onto two inch tape. He's also a student of the guitar. If you haven't already, watch the 2008 documentary It Might Get Loud, which features Jack, The Edge from U2, and Jimmy Page of Led Zeppelin, all trying to explain the relationships they have with the electric guitar. Jack's favorite guitar is still a 1964 Montgomery Ward J.B. Hutto Airline. That's the red and white guitar that we saw him playing all the time with the white stripes. Now, they don't make them anymore because the company went out of business in 1968. He has others from Gretsch and Harmony, but that old airline is always on standby. And so is a K Archtop made sometime in the late 1950s or early 1960s. Jack is a lot like Adam Jones in that he's always looking for ways to wring interesting sounds out of his guitars. And maybe the best example is Seven Nation Army from the White Stripes 2003 album Elephant. The seven note riff was played on that K Archtop. And the reason it sounds like a bass guitar is because it's funneled through a whammy pedal set to transpose the sound down one octave. And the amplifier? Believe it or not, it's from Sears, as in the department store. It was built sometime in the mid-1960s and was in like a Christmas catalog or whatever. Proving again that it's often not about how much gear you got or how expensive that gear is, but what you can do with the gear you have. A song that will be a worldwide sports anthem for decades, and one recorded using a Sears amplifier in an old 8-track recording studio in London called Toreg. Two more guitar heroes to come. If you're a fan of Rage and Muse, well, you already know who's coming next, right? This is part one of a two-parter on guitar heroes, and there were two more guys I want to discuss. The first is Matt Bellamy of Muse. He's doing things with a guitar that make his style, technique, and technology very hard to unpack. What Eddie Van Halen was to the late 1970s and early 1980s, uh, you could say that Matt is the equivalent to the 2000s. Not only is he technically proficient, okay, very proficient, he also has a three-octave vocal range. He's an excellent piano player. He knows his way around a recording studio, and he never, ever stops looking for new sounds. We can observe a number of things about his playing style. First of all, he likes arpeggios. This is when you take the three notes of a chord and play them individually one after another in either ascending or descending order. This is a cool technique because when you need to, you can go back and forth between the arpeggio and the full chord. Matt loves outboard gear like pitch shifters and fuzz pedals and all kinds of gear that adds various amounts of delay and reverb. 
Duplicating what he does is actually really hard because his guitars are custom made by a British guy named Hugh Manson. He packs all kinds of weird technology on board into the guitar. So we're not entirely sure what those guitars can do. He calls them Matocasters. And one of his favorites has seven strings. Matt doesn't mind soloing, using tremolo, using the whammy bar and whatever effects he has on hand. And as for style, he incorporates everything from prog rock to progressive metal to some forms of electronica, even, even classical. And if you want to get really nerdy, you can find similarities between some Muse songs and Chopin and Rachmaninoff. Let's listen to something, taking note of all the different layers of guitar sounds, along with everything else that Matt jams into this song. Here's Starlight. Muse featuring Matt Bellamy. We have time for one more male guitar hero, and that's Tom Morell. He's always been one of my favorites. Tom first picked up a guitar at age 13, a K guitar, a cheapo Japanese thing that cost about 100 bucks. And within weeks, he was playing in a Led Zeppelin cover band. But he really didn't start getting serious about studying the guitar until he was about 20. And that's when he picked up a Gibson Explorer. Around the same time, he formed a band called Electric Sheep that featured some guy named Adam Jones on bass. And this... Gibson Explorer was the guitar he took with him when he enrolled in Harvard. He still has it. He got deeper into hip-hop and rap. Public Enemy and Run DMC were big influences, which also moved him to start scratching his guitar strings like a DJ would on a turntable. He also spent a lot of time listening to old Black Sabbath records, noting how guitarist Tony Iommi often exhibited restraint, realizing that the space between the notes could be as important as the notes themselves. He holds his guitar a little differently. He plays it way up high on the body. And that's done deliberately because it gives him more room to move his hands up and down the strings and to create all sorts of unusual sounds on the body of the guitar and the fretboard. And naturally, you can't do any of this without all sorts of effects pedals. Tom has dozens of guitars, but his most famous is probably a custom job that he calls his Arm the Homeless Electric. He calls it this because he carved that slogan, Arm the Homeless, into the body of the guitar sometime in the early 1990s. He bought it in 1986 from a luthier. That's what you call a guitar maker. This guy was in Hollywood. And Tom did not like it at first. So he started switching out all the individual components. All that's left of that original guitar is the wood used for the body. But despite all the changes and all the abuse... This has been his main guitar, except during his audio slave period, when he experimented with others, including a special Fender he called Soul Power. Let's sample something from 1996. This is Tom with Rage Against the Machine. He's playing the Arm the Homeless guitar through a whammy pedal on Bulls on Parade. <laughs> And there you have a sampling of some of the great alt-rock guitar heroes of the alternative era, which is to say since the 1990s. We have Johnny Greenwood of Radiohead, Adam Slack from The Struts, Josh Homme from Queens of the Stone Age, Matt Bellamy from Muse, John Frusciante, ex of the Chili Peppers, Tools Adam Jones, Jack White, and Tom Morello. On the next Guitar Heroes program, we're going to turn it over to the women. They've been overshadowed by the dudes far too long, far too often, which is just wrong. So we're going to let the women shine on the next show. Until then, you can visit my website, which is a journal of musical things.com. It's updated all the time and comes with a free daily newsletter. All you have to do is sign up for it and you'll get fresh music news and information in your inbox every single day. Never any spam either. I can also be found on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And should you want to try email, I'm pretty good with answering. It's alan at alancross.ca. Talk to you next time when we look at female guitar heroes of the alternative era. Technical Productions by Rob Johnston. I'm Alan Cross. You've been listening to the Ongoing History of New Music podcast with Alan Cross. Subscribe to the podcast through iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, and everywhere you find your favorite podcasts.